Meantime, so Kate Snow works for NCI and she's um, she was one of the NCI people involved in this project in which also people from the Bureau and CSIR are involved and we all kind of trying to work to um, to give a better CMIP experience. Can we put it like that? So <laughs> uh, she'll start introducing, I ask her to maybe just say a couple of things about CMIP 6 because it's kind of a little bit different from CMIP 5. So we won't cover this at all. We're just going to touch um, on, just so people is aware there are differences and eventually we'll have an induction which will go into this in a bit more deeply. But it's just something I thought people, especially if someone didn't have an experience, previous experience with CMEP, need to know. Although you all look like experienced users. Can you wait? Okay, me? so you can go on, Kate, if you want. All right. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'm really just going to skim through these slides pretty quickly because it's we just want to give you a bit of a taste on CMIP at the moment. But we're, as Paula said, we're going to try to do a, a more thorough induction, uh, hopefully soon. So currently, there are preliminary model outputs on the ESGF. And we've also successfully replicated some priority variables. Um, the actual official public announcement for the release of CMIP 6 hasn't happened yet. They're still waiting on some testing to be done and for more models to be out. So if you, you can sort of see down here, there's only a few experiments uh, available. But hopefully that'll happen soon. They did say October and October is nearly over, so we'll see. In terms of timelines, uh, which may affect people, particularly if they're looking at uh, publications to be assessed in terms of IPCC, we expect the majority of the models to be coming out in 2019. Some more are likely to come out this year, but most of them probably early next year. And for the Australian models, there's two currently registered, the Access CM2 and the Access ESM 1.5. Um, in terms of the IPCC, the submission cutoff deadline, which is a bit small there, and I believe it is the end of 2019 for submissions. So it's a bit of a tight window, and if that is something that's important to you, um, try to be a bit on top of what variables you need, and so you can let us know, and we can provide whatever you need. Very quickly, just looking at CMIP 6 compared to CMIP 5. CMIP 6 is certainly a lot more complex than what we've seen in CMIP 5. In this case, we've got over 100 models, uh, nearly 300 experiments, and we're expecting about 18 petabytes. Names have changed between the two MIPS. So, for example, uh, RCP 4.5 is now SSP 245. So that was representative concentration pathways, and now it's uh, shared socioeconomic pathways. So if you're looking at comparing things between CMIP 5 and CMIP 6, you just need to be aware of how things have changed. MIPS also means something different. So in CMIP 5, CMIP 5 covered, uh, I think it was about 180 experiments. That was what CMIP 5 was. And it was distinct from PMIP or GeoMIP or Cortex. In CMIP 6, CMIP itself is only the DEC and its historical runs. So it's only 11 experiments. The other experiments that used to be covered under CMIP 5 are now different MIPS. So for example, the SSP ones, they're under scenario MIP. So again, whatever experiments you need, you're going to need to look at actually what the new um, naming convention is and what the MIP is. And finally, there's things like directory structure and file name that have changed as well. But again, we don't want to go into detail of this now because we're just trying to give you an overview and we'll do this all in more detail later on. Um, and finally, just accessing it at NCI. So for CMIP 5, you're probably used to accessing it, accessing it all under UA6. We're actually in the process of getting an official re uh, replica of what's on UA6, and that's going to be in a project called AL33. 
So CMIP5 is going to be split into two projects, one for the Australian data, that's on RR3, and one for the official replica on RR33. The same is going to happen for CMIP6. So we're going to have one project for the official Australian data and one for the replicated data. And currently what we have in the replicated data is OI10. Um, it's still all preliminary, but if you do want to look at it, you're welcome to join that project. Uh, you just do that through the Yep. When you say Australian CMIP5 or CMIP6, is that, how, does it, how is that different to the replication? Is that so, the process stuff that we do? Yes, so it would be the access model output, essentially. No, that's different. So, 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 so what I'm talking about is uh, we have um, the replicated data, which is, uh, which is a subsection of what's on ESG. Um, yeah. And then usually we have a space where we then put all of the process stuff that we, that we need. You know, and, and so under CMIP5, for example, we said we had, uh, I don't know how many terabytes of this, uh, of the replicated data, and then, uh, but the process stuff was almost 10 times as much. Right. The process stuff is not oh, accounted for in these projects. So this is the official replication and the published model output of the Australian data. Okay, so, so when you say CMIP5 Australian, that's access only, nothing else. Well, it's also things like there's some Australian Cortex and some from the CSIRO uh, Mark 3 l as well. Okay, yeah, 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 but it's basically the contribution for up that was uploaded or that's available across the... Yes. the so, yep. so that, because that raises the question of where and how um we process that you know the data basically because that is like as, as i said we the, the estimates i've been giving to <coughs> to peter may and and others here it's usually around 10 times as much as what we download as this the the our priority um rep and stuff that's locally available yeah. um sorry around maybe we could leave this at the end because we got yeah. strictly yeah. one hour and it's more about the tool, but we just want people to be aware of this organization and potential. All right, cool. Um, so then I'll pass on to Carla. <laughs> so, okay, great. <laughs> so, um, as you say, part of this project was to provide a tool. We did that with CIMA 5 at some stage. Uh, we did create our own database and we have this tool called RSSI, which we use ourselves to help us working out um, what user we're looking for and then some, some people that I can see here as well um, might as well use it. Um, eventually, NCI uh, created a database which is called MASS, which index allows you to index all the files you have in a project and also load all the attributes from these files um, onto a database table. And so we, we started looking at um, basically using this database rather than the very simple SQLite for a lot of good reason. Um, and this is the result of it. Um, at the moment is, is working mostly as a common line is working only on the VDI and this is because basically you need some sort of level authorization to um, uh, to read the database and currently that's what we got but eventually it will work on raging it will be part of um, our conda modules at the moment we have this uh, test environment that you can try to use um, and this are the free comments also sent by email if, if you want to try to access it. Um, to, so to be able to access it later on, you will have to request to be part uh, of the OI10 project, I think, or we'll confirm that later, um, which you will have to do in any case to access the CME6 data. So it should work fine like that. Um, so if you stop sharing i'll go to the notebook and we can start seeing uh, an example of this work i'm sorry i need to find my and 
share. Okay, so I'm using a notebook here, but um, really you don't need it. In fact, it works a lot better just on the common line. <laughs> I'm just using this so then it's a bit annotated and people can download it and, and have a go. Um, so, uh, I guess we start, sorry, just a second, I should try to remind myself. Right, so remember this is still like a new release. It works both for SIMA 5 and SIMA 6. SIMA 5, as you know, if you um, is the one actually we have a few more problems making it work properly because there's a lot of exception. If you have an experience with SIMA 5, you will be aware of that. So, um, but we thought it was a good idea to start showing it to people to get feedback now, rather when there is a lot of SIMA 6 data available, you want to start working and then it turns out is is failing for everybody, as usually does. Um, so let's start seeing it. Um, as I said, it, although it's all written in Python, uh, it just works as a common line. So once you have um, activated your test environment, you can just run clef and it will tell you what's the basic usage. Basically what we've done, it will be the corresponded that I mean run with the help option. And as you can see, there are a few options there apart from help, which are mostly um, um, going to manage the way the results or the query um, will be handled. And then there are a couple of subcommons, uh, which we decided to use a different subcommons for each data sets. And maybe in the future, we'll have something, say, like Cordex, who will do a specialized search on Cordex. The reason why we have these subcommons is because SIMA 5 and SIMA 6 are really different, right? And we use different terminology and we use the same terms like MIP to indicate two different, completely different things. So, and, and so we had to um, split them in two. Okay, so let's look what the SIMA 5 help tell us. And so we can see all the options you can use. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few options. These basically correspond to all the things you can search on the actual ESGF um, um, website. So we got experiment, model, the table, the variable, ensemble, frequency, real. Um, if you want institution, we're not quite sure what you need that for. If you can use the standard name instead of using the variable name. And uh, these are the one um, about the format is you can get your results uh, listing um, every single file or you can get your result as listing the basically a group of files like this variable, this model, uh, ensemble and what have you. Let's say we define that as a data set. Um, that's actually the default. And then you have another option, which is latest or all versions. So by default, you return the latest available version, or you can try to look for all, if you're looking for a older version and you want to locate it, you um, can use that. Um, the other replica and distrib really are more about um, looking for not just official sources, but also replica sources and distrib, it's really, um, probably more important for us if we want to look across all the nodes or just from one node and normally not going to use it, need that. Okay, so passing arguments and option is quite easy, um, but we'll, we're just going to run a few examples of what's going to happen. So first of all, all I need to do is really to pass Clef with a sub comment. And this is already doing a query. Since I didn't pass any um, constraint, this is not really an error, and actually this is more like, um, I'm sure, it's more like an exception. There are too many results returned. So we are limiting the number of results you can turn, uh, you, you can return, um, which is just simply a feature, actually, of the ESGF um, website itself, and it will, tell you to try limiting your search, eventually you won't see the entire error message. And this is actually what you've been trying to run through the tool. So if you 
are unsure, something will return you. you. You will have a similar message if the tool can't find anything. It will tell you, I can't find anything. This is what I run. You can always use that to see if actually um, there is something on the website. The node could be down. Uh, you might have misspelled something and similar thing. So let's have another example now and actually start putting something in. So we define a variable, which is Tasmin. We define an experiment uh, table, which is basically what used to be called MIP in CIMA5 or Seymour table and uh, an ensemble. Right. So it's again complaining. Um, and the reason is I actually misspell historicals. Uh, this doesn't exist, it doesn't find any match. Um, so let's try again. And as not find anything, but this time, because we actually told him which are the valid value, because I misspelled this time the table, for the table is actually telling me, hey, look that you use this, um, this term, which doesn't exist, and choose between one of these. Um, one other thing we will do, this, I think this is working for variable, for the table, for the model. Um, so it picks up lots of your error, eventually we'll pick up also the experiment. I just totally forgot about doing it. <laughs> but there are some things which we'll never been able to pick up, like the ensemble. We can't really discriminate between the ensemble because the ensemble could be about anything. And I can't know for sure there. Uh, 1,023 is not valid. Um, okay, so let's finally running without any mistake. Okay, this is what returning. So it's, it's, um, and it's still running, in fact. Uh, first of all, it tells us where, as you find uh, local files that match this query. This is normally a lot faster just on your terminal, but let's bear with it. <sighs> Very long. So, but I can tell you in the meantime what he's actually doing is running his search first on the ESGF. It comes back with all the uh, all the data sets in this case that match this constraint. Then you look for them locally. You compare what is found locally with what is found remotely and you start writing your list of what is found locally and then it will tell you if there's something else um, remotely which is not available on the system. So, sure, this is taking a long time. I think this might be a problem of connection um, from the VDI. And it's also connecting to a list of, um, Kate has been uh, just mentioning that we have um, a list of priority variables that NCI is downloading as soon as they are available. And it's not just variable, really, it's a combination of variable experiment and frequency and stuff. So um, Kate is, um, is testing, it's still kind of test mode, I, I, I think, but it will eventually have a table on the web where you can search if uh, something you're interested in to has actually been queued and is uh, queued for download or has just been downloaded recently. And this is what the tool is checking now. So I know sure it's gonna get, it never took that long, obviously. And so it will, tell you as well if you find it there. So, you know, it's actually not missing. Maybe it's just not yet on the database, but it's either on the system or it's going to appear. Oh, there it is. Okay. So this is what is telling us that these data sets are not yet available on the database, but they've been requested or recently downloaded. You can see there is a couple that are queued and all the others have been done. Um, because this, all this thing, Currently, the database and this table are updated really regularly. Um, the results aren't yet, um, you know, reliable in a way. Um, but then eventually we'll have an update probably daily 
or something similar and um, you'll be able to see something has been requested by someone else. Finally, a, a write down what's available on the SJET, but not locally. Right. Um, one other thing I should point out is if you can see this, this is not referring to the UA6, this is referring to the new replica of Simify. So for the moment, if you still want to look for Simify data, just use our society. Okay, so we just look for the latest. Now I'm just limiting to the Access 1.0 model. Before I didn't select the model, so it was just returning results for everything. And here, if I want to look for the older version, uh, is bringing back an older version for TASMIN and Access 1.0. Now, um, because I tested this a lot, I know this, there, there's actually a bug in the ESGF node here, which doesn't show the other ensembles. They should be from <laughs> ensemble. Um, it's just ESGF returning this. So for Simify, we're always going to have a little bit of uncertainty linked to the fact that we are analyzing response for the web, which are wrong. Um, we'll be working on this. But... So, Pal? Um... Yes. On that line there, you put Axis 1.0. Yes. But the model name is coming up as it, 1 hyphen 0. Yeah, the, the tool will correct that. Okay. okay. So, whichever way you put it, there are uh, a few models, Axis 1, normally the one which have a dot in their official name. I don't know if this is repeated also in Sim 6. Um, then the I can't even remember exactly how it works, but uh, say the search uh, will upset just one version of it, uh, but then in the files um, is written in a different way. It's so basically all the file names won't have the dot because it's a bad practice, but the search maybe gets it with a dot. But whichever one you put, it will be corrected automatically by the tool. And that's something that we did for our society as well. Um, yeah. Should have matter about with spotting things. Paula. Um, finally, yes. Quick question. So uh, that's a really nice listing. Do, can you also list the, the actual file names? Um, you can if you put files. So I could just try to do. Um, yeah. Ooh, I can't remember. It's format probably. File. I must have forgot to put a. Um, an example of that. Oh, yeah. That oh, gives cool. you the file. Cool. That gives you the file, and eventually we might add with the file theme. We might also have the tracking ID. I'm not sure if we're gonna do it as a completely separate flag or as a thing. Is one of the things I would like to ask some feedback actually. Um, okay. Yeah. Then we got the Sim Six. The Sim Six basically. Um, Sorry, I left this from one we didn't at the moment. Okay, Simi 6 works in the same way, just has slightly different options. And this is because, for example, the MIP, which is also called activity, uh, is this grouping of experiments that um, Kate was talking about. Uh, then we got experiment is the same. The model, for example, has changed name to source underscore ID. What we down here, and actually I didn't uh, pointed out before is that we often give a couple of names, options, um, depending on what you're used to and where you're coming from. So, you know, uh, to make it easier a bit to switch between the two commands. And also we have abbreviated option, obviously, um, which makes it just a little bit easier. So uh, the member now is what used to be called ensemble and as also an extra um, part to it, which is the forcing, which is this F at the end. Then there are new things, new, completed new things, which is like the grid. Uh, it will allow you to search through model, which has out to output, which is say on the native model grid or which is regridded or sometime, which is regridded on a particular grid on a particular region. Um, you really have to look at the CIMA 6 documentation doc to know what all these labels means. And then there is another one which is nominal resolution, this one here, 
which is more like an approximate resolution. There is a complicated way they calculate that. And this, for example, 250K, I think it means anything in which this calculated resolution falls between 100 to 250K. But if you are looking for a particular, you know, um, resolution in LP to discriminate between different models. I'm trying to think if there's other things which are wildly different. Probably not. So let's run an example of this. I'm sorry again, I need to correct that. Okay, so you can see here, in fact, you can see the F2 this and F1, the different forcing. Um, we've been trying to work out what are the rules around forcing. Um, I think a bit like in the other ensemble, it really depends how the model group had defined that. The good news is that there should be an attribute in the file, which gives you a little bit more information. The bad news is that the people who publish until now haven't put anything in the file. But we look at that. Um, there should be extra documentation online and eventually the tool will be able to um, to look into this documentation as well. It's something we already are working on. Um, okay, so just to notice we use this specific thing. In this case, I use just the abbreviation. Um, and uh, also starting using a different output. If you see here, we just got the local result. Um, so this option that manage the output, we need to go straight on after the main command clef. And we put them there because they are they work the same for CIMI5 or CIMI6. They just manage the way you what you're gonna see. So in this case, you don't see what else might be available remotely and things like that. Um, and I guess in a way control a little bit the flow or the tool. Another one is missing. Missing will just show you instead. I, I just change the variable and as you can see as well, um, I use, I passed two variables this time and I think maybe even before and you had to repeat basically the option that dash be. Um, so this is just showing what's available in ESGF but not locally what's missing. Okay, the other option is just to do um, a remote search. Which shows anything which is on the um, um, on the ESGF is independently that we have it or not. And uh, Finally, okay, this is where I was going to show that we can change these in the format as a file rather than, so as you can see, these are all the files. Okay, this finally the last option, um, which is request. So this is a little bit different. And this is a way you can actually put in a request uh, for new data. So before going on, as we said, um, well, we didn't quite say that, but there was a decision that NCI should be the only one downloading the data. NCI we use to download any data these other tool called Zinda, you don't even need to know. Um, and so every request for data will be need to put to NCI. Uh, Kate has prepared, I think, um, a Google form you can fill in for which she can receive the request. And this is another option um, to prepare a request um, you can then send to NCI. And basically every time you send a request, you do a request like that, there's going to be a ticket open on the help desk. And, and someone will follow up. Uh, potentially, I guess, if you request a lot of stuff, someone might be coming back to you and say, maybe, you know, <laughs> we need to review this. Um, and I think at least you should be given some sort of timeline. And uh, we thought this was the best way to do it. Then NCI knows exactly what is downloading. Uh, There's just one basically one point of reference 
and uh, they can ensure that no one redownloads something that maybe they are being downloading on the thing. Um, what the tool allows you to do, um, and what I suggest, even if you don't want to use this tool, to still look at what's already available before you actually put a request, if you put a request through the Google form. Uh, the tool will do this automatically for you. We'll just cut down what you can request. You, you won't be able to send in a request through this tool or, or something which is already there, or even something which is queued. Um, Otherwise, it works very easily. So I, I had to use a slightly different way here because it will ask us a prompt and I'm going to tell you, no, thanks. Don't create an L test ticket. And what it's saying is it's first telling you that these files are available on the SGF, but not locally yet. And then it's been writing a list of the data sets ID that identify these um, particular files in this file in the directory where I'm working now currently and um, we'll have a look at the file it's really very simple and then he's asking me if I want to proceed and request the missing file by default is no uh, if you pass anything like um, capital or lowercase why yes um, it will send an email to the NCI help desk uh, if you don't want to request immediately, your file has been saved in any case, it tells you whether it's been saved. And you can always send this um, by email to the help desk or going on the help desk website and attaching, um, just add it as an attachment to your request. Um, this is pretty much what it's showing. Now, if we did have, um, this is what's inside the file, basically. It's just something that this tool that can get and, and straight on queue these files for download. Um, if we did have something which was in the queue, I, I just wanted to go for sure on variables which are not, are not in the priority list so we could find something. But um, if we had something which wasn't yet downloaded, that will be um, still eliminated by this list. So you wouldn't find all the thing, but in the file, you will find just the one. Um, so that's all for the tool. Um, is someone, we, we got plenty of time um, for questions. Before, maybe we go on, if we switch, if I stop sharing, um, Kate, can you just share again so we oh. can go to the last couple of slides? Ready? Yeah. Okay, so these are future announcements. We are planning, probably already working on, I, I, I lose track of the time, um, improving the local search results, particularly for CMF5, and this is really handling the whole exception which makes our system fail, and uh, add more validation for the various arguments, um, in particular the experiments one, uh, returning the tracking ID, which you said it could be a return just as um, as default with the files uh, because I know you guys need to list the tracking IDs and stuff or might just be added um, when you run something like a verbose flag which will return extra information you find in the file attributes. So this time the file attributes are meant to have a lot more information so we were thinking maybe to get you a CSV file, like a table in which for each data set you find, you're going to find this is the first thing, this is how the model, you know, the different components of the model, if there is any errata or all the tracking ID into another field and things like that. The way we're going to do it is um, every file contain a URL like that, which has the further info. At the moment, there's really no further info in there. <laughs> we, we check all of them and then we finally discovered the ESGF told us, oh no, we, it's just, you know, a prop there. It's just 
in the place, but eventually at that, that URL, you will find this, there is some errata. Clearly, when you may be working with 50 models, you don't want to have to go yeah. and click for everything and open the file and looking at it. And it's fairly easy for us to have this. So um, I'm going to do this. Um, we are society, you, we have function which help you to just integrate it in your own script. This at the moment is purely a common line. It doesn't mean that if you go there and clone the GitHub record, you might not be able to integrate it better in your script, but eventually we'll look into functions that makes this easier. And uh, similarly, we, we're thinking, we, we know there's a lot of people, especially UNSW, use R. Um, we might get some help, actually, someone else offer to help us, maybe integrating the whatever work we've done to connect to the database we are and potentially adding other constraints, which works in a less straightforward way, like uh, selecting um, data sets which cover particular time periods. I'm thinking of, um, for example, things like uh, pre-industrial control often it covers very different time periods and some people sometimes need just the model which are that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And anything else that you can think about, uh, which is why we prefer to show it to you now um, rather than waiting later on. Uh, Paula, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so it's David Yerostavlio. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess it's, it's on Two uh, the basically two questions. One, um, are we going to do, what's the strategy for checksums um, for files once they are downloaded? Um, are we going to do frequent consistency checks on the um, directories? Um, um, no, really. I mean, Cinda will manage all of that. In fact, the tool itself used the checksum. Um, we, which is why we need to improve the local search because sometimes the checks are not available on ESGF with SIM5 or there are little other quirky things. Hopefully not very often, but it happens. So the tool basically download the checks on, um, um, you know, just it just doesn't get, oh, okay, I found these file names. You say I found these file names and the checksums are these. And then the from the ESGF, and then we look for exactly the same checksum in the database to locate exactly the same file. Yeah, but that's that not what my sense? question. So, so my question is, um, let's say we download a petabyte and that sits on, uh, um, it, on CI, uh, it's almost guaranteed to have, as time goes on, goes by, uh, to have errors. So it's not on a download stage, it's once the data is there. Yeah, um, but the but database will get updated. The database calculated is the checksum from the fault system. It doesn't um, add the checksum from the ESGF to the table. And Cinda will do the same. Cinda will, uh, once something has been um, added, it will look eventually also for changes and things. So the short answer is no. We are not doing check. Oh, uh, checks well, no. Check. Well, we are. Every time we re-update the data, every time the database gets updated fully, it also updates the checksum of the file. So every time you recrawl the file system, which might not be um, done very often, but it will be done, you know, uh, every once in a while, um, then the checksum attached to the files will change if the files have got corrupted or changing. I guess so. that kind of brings me to the next question. So, um, so first of all, uh, from time to time, errors will be found in files uh, in ESGF and they're going to be uh, uh, updates. Um, what I wonder is, and, and that also go to files that we find locally that are corrupted, Let's say I'm going to be using uh, a certain variable. Um, it might be nice if you find a use case, like a, a pattern where I can let you know that this is the variable that I'm using. Okay. Now, if you know that this variable has a checksum error or that you got a, 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 an update of the file from ESG, 
uh, with a correction. It might be no nice that certain people will get emails letting them know that an error was found. Yeah, um, look, this is fairly, I mean, we can try to, and we discuss this. Um, I think this is way past this particular tool. Um, I know that in the past, actually, although not many people knew, CMFI used to have a RSS feed or something like that. You could so you could subscribe for a very specific experiment, like you say, down to a variable, and every time something new was published, which corresponded to you know that group of constraint, you will get a notification. I ask if something like that is going to be available and that's not quite clear to me that it is. We could um, potentially um, create something using that ESDoc interface. So we could add something that's just thinking about it now. Maybe the, the one thing we can do for the tool is to let you write some sort of log um, which will create a link to whatever you're using and then you could compare that if something has changed or get just you know um, yeah. get at least the place where you need to go there's other things we couldn't look into which is some persistent identifier which are not just a file level and not just the tracking ID is like this particular data set identifier or experiment identifier and whatever. So you should be able to build something similar with that, but we do not have access to that yet. Our RSS might work. So basically you just let the user decide if you want to register or not to just apply the RSS feed and he filters um, based on his, the data set that he's going to be using and at least he'll get a notification and he needs to filter them on his own. Yeah, yeah, I, look, I agree with you, but the point is that's more like on an ESGF level. If there's, we can just use the thing in this tool that they do, that they make available, or we can find ways to go around. But for me, uh, to, to, I will have to rerun this constantly um, <laughs> to then be able to tell you, hey, look, something has changed. But, I don't I guess, know, we'll I guess think my, about my, if there is a way to create a simple script that the user can run on their own to... Yeah, I, I guess my point is that uh, 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 files that are, have errors that come from remote and check some errors that you find locally can be handled in the same interface. That's, I guess that's my point. That if, you, if you find a solution for one, find also a solution for the other and try to have the same interface for, for both. Um, yeah, but this necessarily not, um, yeah, anyway, I don't know, maybe we should discuss this another thing. I think some of the things you are looking for are already there. What's not there is the notification. Mm, okay. I, I, I don't have a way, and it's really for NCI to have a way to, to have a list of users and what we're using and a place where people can record what we're using and get notifications. I, I can't really do that. Sorry, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so so uh, th thank you. This looks like a really, really helpful tool. Um, I, I was just wondering when you could say a little bit more about Cordex, because I, um, I know Jason Evans here, for example, is starting to run a whole bunch of Cordex simulations for Australia, and it would be really nice to see that kind of thing included. Um, and I don't know whether, like you've already been talking to him about uh, making sure that his data can be integrated into this tool. I'm not quite sure how much work there has to be done at the kind of provider end of the data or whether it sits on the tool developers or a bit of both. <laughs> Yeah, no, actually, that's the future announcement I forgot. Um, basically, anything which is said about the ESGF can be relatively easily um, added. Um, the only reason we didn't do it now, we want to make sure that this was working for this at the start, and because we noticed, for example, where between CIM5 and CIM6, they did change the way. It's not just they different, but they also use different terminology when you do the search, and you had to search in, onto slightly different website. Yeah. 
Um, but, you know, and Cordex will have arguments which are slightly different. So we didn't want to start adding everything together and then if something doesn't work, it becomes really difficult. But yeah, actually it was the next one in line. So um, cool. we're definitely going to do that. And then he, and the Cordex will be sitting at NCI in the same projects as the CMIP. Um, so we can add that to the database if it's not already in there. Probably is already in there. Anyway, right. so it's it, we know how to do it now, and we definitely are interested in doing that. I'm just, just wondering, would that extend as far as um, kind of um, downscaling to resolutions finer than Cordex? So, if, for example, if Jason were to decide to do some finer resolution simulations over Sydney or something and made made the the whole structure kind of Cordex compliant, could we um, could we include that in the tool? I, I'm not just thinking of Jason here, but I'm thinking, you know, across the country, you could imagine different different states wanting to downscale for their particular areas. Yeah, I reckon one at the moment, as I say, we are looking from the all our starting point is the ESGF, uh, but we are looking this. Um, we are looking to add this kind of more just local search, so an extra search um, just on the database. And uh, if he has the same, if he uses the same directory structure and everything, and it's on the database, then that's totally possible, even if it's not officially published. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, and could I ask another question about the forcing and the SSPs as well? Um, so, so the name of the the, the RCP 4.5 you said it changed to SSP 245 um, and that's 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 just a name change is it because I guess my understanding was there were these SSPs that that were kind of socio-economic storylines that could be consistent with um, you know one or more RCPs so this is just like a cosmetic thing is it and um, look, I know maybe Aurel can answer this better. I haven't really looked into that. What I know, though, for example, is that there could be a similar, something similar to RCP A5 also under a different MIP, right? Which maybe run things with a particularly odd zone settings or configuration. So it, there's the scenario ones, but then you could have that repeated under different activities or MIP, whatever. So, um, um, Ian, it's not cosmetic, and and if you look at, there's been a um, for each MIP there is a publication out there that was published either last year uh, or the year before. And if you look at that publication at uh, uh, um, for for the scenario MIP, you will find that now this uh, scenario is is, um, is a matrix, and it and it has on one side the the differences in the forcing, uh, like four, five, eight, five, six, and stuff, but and in the in the other dimension, um, it has the um, socio-economic um, stuff. And so my my guess is that two, four, five refers to, to a position in that matrix, and and Aww. so and so it'll be there'll be other possible four fives, but mm. uh, the different years in the experiments tell you that not every cell in the matrix is required. And so there'll be tier one things in that matrix that, that, that run there, but um, uh, not, uh, not everything is required. We have Kate has a mat matrix. Kate has the matrix, so it's just the one ah, there. There you go, there you go. Uh, uh, um, yes. So there you see, so, so 245 is SSP2 and forcing 4.5. And, it, and that is a tier one uh, requirement. So, so it'll be part of the um, uh, tier one scenario. Mm, got it, got it. So yeah, okay. So that's, that's um, <clears throat> that, that happens for, for, the, for that example. We've only got um, four or five and SSP two are the only matches there. And then it's a little bit more complicated for 
SSP one because the dark blue are all tier ones. Oh, so I I ones that have to be ones of, no, for each forcing is you see there'll be um, a one, two, six, two, four, five, a three, seven, and a four, uh, and a and a five, eight, five. These are the tier mm. ones. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. And the F part of the what you call it the ensemble will give more details about what kind of land use data sets and aerosol data sets used used in the forcing is that is that the right kind of idea no, i'm not so familiar with uh, uh, with that one on on the on the name and kind of what actually the f for forcing what it refers to i'm not okay. familiar. yeah so we we look into that and it really depends on um, the the recommendation of him was like use f1 for the main first thing you're going to use and then use f2 f3 if you change the first thing kind of thing. okay okay <laughs> so you can um, unfortunately like like generally the ensemble or member or whatever you want to call it for simplify it just add meaning inside that particular model you know the group of simulation of that particular model so um hopefully say access whatever it's going to be the thing i can't remember right now we'll have we'll use you know uh r1 i1 p1 and f1 consistently and anything which falls yeah. into that will have you know would have been run in a similar way apart i guess r1 that's just the realization um and that's why we we are trying to connect to that yes doc because and and we're going to make use of all the attributes which you haven't seen there's a very long thing of attributes and one is also uh gives you more info about the model composition and more info in theory about the forces mm. so if That's that information right. isn't in the file itself it should be on that document it's just not and uh, and that's why we got back to the ESGF because our understanding is that that's required to publish. Okay, you can't publish any more something uh, without giving enough information about how the model has been run, or what composed the model, um, but, and then people had to go crazy and send you an email to work it out. So, okay, um, thank you. I've got a question for you, Paula. Yes. So uh, just uh, um, seeing that we're just almost running out of time. Um, so the, on the SGF, there's also the ANA for MIP and OPS for MIP. Is that uh, part of that search um, that we could also search the OBS and the reanalysis data sets that are up there? And, and related to this, um, I guess if we have the right directory structure, we could also have a local version of what we put together as OPS and reanalysis that people might want I don't know mm -hmm. if, if that's I mean I guess potentially the mechanism is there the 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 problem is when then people put on publish stuff which doesn't follow yeah um, the various rules so anything that can be searched on the SGF in theory should be possible to um, be loaded or anything which is stored in this particular project or potentially we could add an extra project but it's always the problem is always if you follow different rules, then it becomes a huge amount of work doing that. And it becomes more complicated to maintain it and doing all the other stuff, which actually reminds me if you can switch to the last slide. This one. So, the last okay. one. so I really have to thank Scott who's been doing all the hard work on connecting the mass, which was really amazing. And then obviously, um, um, Kate has been incredibly helpful. Sean Pringle works for NCI and is the guy who works on the mass database and Claire Tram as well for giving a lot of feedback and testing and ideas and all sorts of things. So thanks again, particularly Scott, Can thanks. Can I add something on that subject yeah. of um, what could be searchable and um, if you really want something to be searchable via this tool, we would really appreciate her developing it. So I uh, don't hesitate to volunteer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well,
well thanks for every to everybody who contributed to this it looks really awesome yeah it looks awesome yeah thank, thank you thank you yeah, thank you Chris. thanks so we'll are we good no more questions hmm. okay perfect thank you for coming right. thanks for thank coming you. and give us feedback please and ideas yes, we'll do. So. yes. thanks Paola. thanks Paola. thank you all right